Good Friday morning, everyone. Welcome to 2021. My name is Tim, and this is the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist Series. As one often does with the changing of the calendar year, I had some time to reflect on the first 30-ish episodes of the series, and I want to share a little bit about what I've gleaned from my reflection. First, my favorite times are the time I spend with the folks who tune in live on Friday mornings, just got off with you. It's it's, and then at the end of the series, it's always kind of an abrupt letdown when the screen shuts off at 10 o'clock and it's over. And I do this for my attic for privacy and to minimize family interruptions. But, but when the screen goes blank, I always take a minute to pause and reflect when it's over. And it's usually because of the things that you all say as we discuss the episodes and your stories and your experiences. And then that kind of gives me the boost and, and I get excited thinking about, you know, the build up to the next Friday and my interactions with you all. There's so many dark spots in the world and there's so many light spots. And I really value this new community that's formed. And I've said it many times, but thank you again for tuning in. And, and to those who, who are watching this recorded, thank you too. I'm, I'm truly honored to be sharing this time with you whenever it is and wherever you are. The second thing that has become evident to me is not that there's so much more to our backyard wildlife and our home wildlife, and in this case, our body's wildlife, than I even anticipated when starting this. And it's just super cool to me that you can step right outside where you're staying or where you're staying and be so close to some truly magical ecological processes in your backyards or your local green spaces. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the book knowledge, the, the fast facts, the cool facts that you can pull out at a party to impress your friends. Like, did you know there's an inversely proportional relationship between a possum density and Lyme disease in urban neighborhoods? So there's plenty of that and I dig it, I really do. Which is why, you know, I hope you all start coming to trivia nights because it's really fun. But I'm, I'm talking more about that, that mind blowing or, or I probably should say that mind opening process that they really don't want you to think about or at least historically, the they being that kind of that academic world, the mainstream world that, that really dismisses um, the parts that Robin Wall Kimmerer calls that emotional intelligence or the spiritual ways of knowing. For example, something we've referenced before, we, we learned and, and textbooks tell us that trees and forests, you've heard this before, are locked in this epic battle for light, nutrients, and water, and only the strongest survive. But after hearing Caitlin Reinhardt's last time or Suzanne Samard or Robin Wall Kimmerer talk, you start to paint a picture that opens up avenues of thought that probably get you way closer to the truth. My traditional scientific mind tells me it's ridiculous to think that trees have some way of sensing the presence of me as I walk by. And I haven't quite completely taken that leap, but evidence supports that trees do have more connections with their surroundings than previously thought through, through mycorrhizal connections and other things that we don't understand yet. You know, the trees share resources with different species that they communicate, that they're able to lure invertebrates to their death when their certain nutrients are low with the help of fungus and bacteria. Um, we found out from Caitlin that trees need to sleep. So yeah, I, I now think it's possible that trees might have some semblance of a sense of awareness uh, that I, would never have even compt contemplated a year ago. So I, I think it's totally fitting to open up a new year with that thought of Backyard Naturalist with an episode on the living community that we carry in and on our bodies, uh, which is the human microbiome, the, the bacteria, the archaea, the viruses, the fungi, the protozoa, and other life forms that have a huge impact on who we are, not so much as humans, but as individuals. And uh, just like how the study of trees opened up so many new avenues of thought for me, so did the study of the human microbiome. But before we get started, 2021 is also sure to bring in some wonderful new content on the parent website for the Backyard Naturalist, the UEC in my backyard. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've added an animals in winter scavenger hunt and a coloring activity for the kiddos. There's three videos in Espanol, two on making a home terrarium by educator Miguel Santos and a brand new Leyendo con Lucero, a reading of La Luz de Lucia, read by educator Lucero Serna. 
There's also new five facts with Danny about the Northern Cardinal and a great blog written by Ethan Bott that sums up the results of the Milwaukee Fall Phenology Challenge and introduce, introduces the species to look for for the winter challenge. So if you're digging using iNaturalist for your adversity and you want more, check out the UEC's Milwaukee Phenology Challenges. Next week's Yardversity theme is winter animal tracking and the package includes trivia on Thursday night and a guest lecture for the 9 a.m. Backyard Naturalist series next Friday at this time by University of Wisconsin Stevens Point professor Chris Yonke, who is just a delight to listen to. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to tune in for that. And also a quick reminder that uh, the new episodes of the Urban Ecology Podcast come out every couple of weeks and you can support that project by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. This week's episode trailer is by educator Bryn Drone, who has a video on how to make a combination sun catcher wildlife feeder uh, with an accompanying activity guide. So take it away, Bryn. Let's get started. First, you'll need a pan. This could be any size or shape. Some that work great are muffin tins, bunt pans, mine is circular, or just about any pan you can find in your kitchen will work. Then you'll need some fruit. We used oranges, cranberries, and some old blueberries I found in my refrigerator. You can add any nature items you'd like. Go take a look around your yard. I added pine cones, a piece of branch that fell off my Christmas tree, anything you wanna add. And finally, some scissors and yarn. Start adding your items. Don't worry too much about where they end up. When you add the water, they all move around a little bit. Once you've added everything, slowly fill it up with water. Grab your yarn and string and cut yourself a piece of string that'll be used to hang it. This can be as long or short as you'd like. Next, pop it in the freezer or if it's below freezing overnight, let it freeze outside. Time to enjoy your sun catcher. Put it outside on a tree, maybe somewhere that's visible from inside your house. Admire the beauty, but don't be too upset when it melts. Animals will enjoy your goodies. Birds and squirrels will be pleased with this winter treat. Thank you, Bryn. So, on to the main feature, the human microbiome. Um, I say this a lot. In fact, I'm going to say this again in a few weeks when, when I talk about the crow. Uh, but this episode, this topic could easily fill an entire season rather than a single episode. I mean, you could do entire episodes on just on, on each of the different types of organisms that live on and in us. Um, you could do an entire episode on uh, what lives in your belly button, as Jenny reminded me with the belly button project. Uh, so to say we're scratching the surface on this topic in a half hour is an understatement of an understatement, more like we're scratching part of a small scratch that's on the surface. So uh, to get the most out of this episode, in my opinion, requires an open mind. Uh, and also I'm going to talk about human health. So I feel obligated to say I'm not a doctor and uh, nothing I mention in this lecture should be taken as medical advice. Uh, please leave that up to the professionals or the other trusted uh, sources you currently rely on. But it's also not an understatement to mention how cutting edge the research into the human microbiome is. The more we look into the critters that live in and on us, the more we find out how connected they are to our physical and emotional health. And this is an area where, where we will likely see some of the biggest breakthroughs in human health. And uh, like with many areas of science, one of the hurdles will be the established, the establishment, in this case, the established medical practices uh, and, and the barriers they often present. Um, so I'd, I'd also like to credit a couple of the bigger sources of information for this episode, the, the powerhouse machine of How Stuff Works and their team of researchers, including the, the Stuff You Should Know podcasters and, and an episode of the Ologies podcast with Ali Ward interviewing microbiologists. Dr. Elaine Shaw, uh, seen here with a stuffed poop emoji that she keeps in her lab. 
Uh, I'll start off with a very quick review of the types of critters we're talking about that live with you. And uh, we go way more into this classification, the classification of life forms in earlier episodes, especially the ones on archaea and mycorrhizae. But for a really long time, anything that was alive was either grouped as a plant or an animal. And then during the 20th century, there was a lot of classification schemes that were proposed. Some, some are still more or less in favor. Uh, depending on who you talk to, but we're looking at essentially today this three domain system that includes archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes, uh, and they all differ in how the cells are structured physically and chemically, and you've seen this slide a lot, um, and members of all three of these domains are currently in your body. Uh, also, depending on the system you look at, there are or have been between two and eight different kingdoms of life, and Often these classification systems are somewhat arbitrary, but in addition to archaea and bacteria, which make up their own domains and kingdoms, you also break down the eukaryotes into groups like animals and plants and fungi, protists, and, and some will separate out the protozoa. All past, current, and future backyard naturalist topics. So it's a little hard for me to figure out where to start from here, but I landed on a connection I made early on in the research, and that is that we use the name human microbiome or the human biome. And to me, and to many of you, I'm sure, biomes are associated with climate types on the planet. You have your tundra biome, your taiga, your, you can see here your tropical rainforests and savannas, your deserts and shrublands. And bios are de biomes are, are defined as biological communities that have common characteristics for the environment in which they exist. So if we sit on those words, biological communities that have common characteristics for the environment in which they exist. It's why polar animals tend to be larger. It's why tropical plants invest more in defense. And uh, so now I'll ask you to come along with me in that leap to think of how the different parts of your body also have very different physical and chemical characteristics. So if you're a microbe, the oily environment on a human scalp is gonna be very different from the environment in your intestines, which is gonna be very different from the environment in your mouth or your ear or your eyebrows or your forearm or your belly button or your nose. Your body produces environments that are as different from each other to these, bi to these microbiota uh, as Antarctica is from Brazil. So organisms that live in the fold of your elbow might perish in your ear because they're not adapted for that environment. So your body is really like a planet that was colonized by organisms starting in the womb and continues to receive immigrants and to release emigrants throughout your entire life. So it's something to really ponder next time you're sitting with your thoughts. Um, so how much life do we carry with us? 90% of all the cells in your body are not human, 90%. And a healthy human can be carrying five pounds of bacteria alone, five pounds. Do you know it weighs five pounds? A two liter bottle of soda weighs five pounds. That's how much extra bacterial weight you could be carrying with you right now. Uh, and bacterial cells range from a 10th to a hundredth the size of our giant human cells. So that really puts into perspective how much bacteria are in our bodies. From a genetic perspective, if you scanned all the genes in the human body, only one in a hundred of those genes would be human. Uh, there are a hundred times more microbial genes than human genes. Uh, and because Tori might be listening and with apologies to the grown-ups here, when you take a poop, up to half of the mass in that poop can be living or dead microbes. Uh, and now because I'm sure some of you are following the same mind track that I did, I had to look up the weight of an average human poop. And a nice Thanksgiving poo could weigh up to a pound. So I'll let you do the math. Um, and while I was on the topic, and because I've already lost any shred of dignity, I did find out that farts also have weight. Uh, I'd like to say I digress, but those of you who know me know that's a lie. So the average human has somewhere in the order of 100 trillion microbes. 
And if we go back to that comparison of biomes on earth to biomes in your body, it's, it's really the diversity of your biome that keeps you healthy, just like a diverse rainforest community maintains stability and ecosystem health. There are a lot of people researching the human microbiome right now, um, especially through the Human Microbiome Project, which is a collaboration of over 80 institutions uh, with at least a few years ago had a, a close to a $200 million budget. And one of the first things they looked for but couldn't find was sort of what's a baseline or reference for what a healthy human microbiome looks like. They, I think, I, I think it was like a thousand people came in, they asked for healthy people to come in and, and, you know, like submit their microbiome for the study. And of those only 242 people were deemed healthy enough by the researchers. And even among them, 85% uh, of them first needed to get major dental work to kind of clear away their periodontal diseases before they were considered, you know, healthiest of the healthy. Um, and, and they found there is no such thing as uh, a typical baseline healthy microbiome. There is no reference that we can look at because everyone listening to me now, no matter what your state you're in, you have a completely unique ecosystem in your body. Um, which makes sense when you consider how complex life is and the life in us really is, but it's really diversity that's the key. So in a Wisconsin forest, wolves play an important part in keeping deer populations from getting out of control. In your body, your virome or your viruses uh, play an important part in keeping your bacteria under control. Your viruses are constantly attacking your bacteria and vice versa. In fact, Every second of every day, you have major predator-prey relationships happening throughout your body all the time. And uh, this brings us to a couple important points. Uh, first, we worry, and rightly so, about getting infected with things when we're traveling, when, you know, anywhere we go, like E. coli and streptococcus. Uh, on the other hand, it's extremely likely that we have, all of us have E. coli and other very harmful organisms in our body right now and all the time. But that's part of that diversity, but we're protected by our immune system and this diverse biome community that maintains this healthy internal balance. Uh, second, when you take an antibiotic, and again, I'm not giving medical advice here, antibiotics really function like a slash and burn approach. Um, and, and they've saved lives, and, and while they may save you by bringing a particular species under control, it's also doing a major shakeup to your biome. It's a wide spectrum. It's killing, you know, everything. So there's a good reason to believe that much of these medicinal breakthroughs that we're going to look, you know, probably see soon will likely come in how we treat infections and looking for alternatives to these wide spectrum antibiotics, um, you know, and it may seem intuitive that we try to find antibiotics that only target a particular species of bacteria, but there's also a real danger that that bacteria you're trying to get rid of is also keeping something else in your body in check. So if you get rid of that completely, you might be doing more harm. It's like, uh, like you know, the land stewardship team in, in, in the Urban Ecology Center, you know, if they release this random, random organism uh, to kill something that's going bad, you know, that's, that's causing problems, you have no idea what the effects of that would be on everything else. So it, it, in fact, I've, I've heard of biotics that you introduce into your body as native and non-native, as invasive and uh, non-invasive. So there really are kind of some similarities there with controlling your human biome with, you know, with, with stewarding the land and the plants in the land. Um, so, uh, and, and we're also aware that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics and cause huge problems. Um, but, but more likely is that there really is a potential for the study of the human biome to lead to more effective and kinder and more gentle uh, effect, uh, like effective ways of curing diseases. Um, even cancer, which is one of the most awful diseases with some of the most brutal, brutal uh, forms of treatment uh, recent studies show that there are cancers that actually 
will cloak themselves in your biome residue to help them slip past the immune response, which is both fascinating and horrifying. But again, a better understanding of how our human biome interacts with your body systems could lead to much more effective and gentler treatments uh, than things like full spectrum antibiotics or steroids or chemotherapy. And it's probably not a stretch to say that all diseases are likely related uh, to this biome in some way or another. Um, we'll, we'll get into a little bit uh, later more, more on that. So if we start looking at the different biome communities, we see some interesting patterns and correlations. The average human mouth likely harbors 5,000 different species of bacteria. And I love this image because of the title, Habitats of the Mouth, because again, to a bacteria, the different parts of your mouth are like the different habitats in a forest. They're, you know, the canopy layer, the, the humus layer, the subterranean layer, uh, the shrub layer. And the mouth is one of the better studied microbiomes. Um, and I'm sure most of us are aware that proper oral hygiene is, is uh, one of the ways that we can control a particular bacteria, Streptococcus mutans, which is responsible for tooth decay. Um, as the human diet has changed with cultural changes throughout our history and sugar became widely available in many forms, periodontal disease also became a pretty big deal. And it's why we spend time and money getting our teeth sealed and cleaned. If left untreated, the species can not only lead to gum disease, but it's connected to heart disease. And this is where we kind of draw another comparison between human biomes and earth biomes. You may have heard of Gaia or the goddess of the earth and how the earth can be thought of as an organism where all the parts are connected and it's very similar connections between the biomes. Uh, in a human body, the different parts and systems are also connected like this. Uh, and in this case is a direct connection between your gums and your heart but there are many more direct and more indirect examples of this too. Um, another human biome that gets probably the most attention recently is the biome in the human gut. And it's kind of strange to think about it, but in one way your gut, from the moment you put food in your mouth to the moment where some form of that food leaves your body at the other end, that food never really entered your body. Your digestive system is really like a tube that goes through your entire body. And really, if it weren't for several important sphincter muscles along the way, it would be much easier to look at that whole system as outside your body. Uh, if you look at some of the most rudimentary forms of multicellular life, like a sponge, it's a little easier to look at the di digestive system as external to the body. But it's a very similar concept with humans just much more complex. The, the gut biome has very strong direct and indirect understood and yet to be understood connections with your entire body, uh, all the parts of your body. So an obvious connection has to do with digestion. As food passes through your body, your gut biome helps you break down nutrients that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. Just as a gut biome in a termite helps it digest wood or allows a cow to digest grass. Your gut biome also synthesizes essential vitamins and things like neurotransmitters. Serotonin, uh, which is an important mood stabilizing neurotransmitter linked to depression and anxiety, 90% uh, of the serotonin is produced by your gut biome. So if your gut biome is out of balance, that could have a very strong effect on your mood. And, and, and in some cases in, in related, related to depression and anxiety. Uh, so there's this direct connection between the bacteria in your gut and your brain and your mood in this case. Gut microbes are likely an important factor in obesity because the bacteria affect how your body stores and uses energy. What's less clear is the effect of the many different kinds of probiotics available on the market. In theory, taking probiotics makes sense because you're adding uh, what we consider good organisms into your biome. But the efficacy of probiotics is still very poorly understood. And often the little research that has been done is funded by the companies that make the probiotics. So it's probably safe to continue to take probiotics. I kind of look at it at, at like feeding birds in your backyard. You're probably not hurting the birds. You're probably not helping them. 
Um, so go ahead and do it. And it's, it's, it's likely the similar case of probiotics, but uh, it's important to know that probiotics can do damage and, and uh, you know, based on your individual system, they can throw your system more out of whack. Um, so what all of this really comes down to in the end is, is how you personally feel after taking the probiotics or really anything that you eat, which led me to probably my big, biggest kind of philosophical leap or connection is the more I look into the gut biome, the more I see relationships resembling mycorrhizal relationships in plants. With mycorrhiza, plant roots form a connection with the mushroom hyphae, but there's a whole host of microbes like bacteria that are involved in that relationships. And trees have been evolving with these bacteria for millions and millions of years, as have animals. Uh, with mycorrhiza, the, the, you know, we, we've been able to study that a little bit more recently. Um, but if we look at the human gut, there are five, whoops, five times as many neural endings along your gut than in your spinal cord. There's a lot of neural information that is directly coming from your gut to your body. Your body is getting a ton of information and signaling from your gut. And, and just like with mycorrhiza, there's a lot of direct and indirect signaling going on uh, between the bacteria in your gut and your brain in this case. Um, in fact, sometimes I wonder how much we're actually involved in this party. If we're just like along for the ride and it's the bacteria that control us as their host organism. And, and then you could get into discussions on maybe on free will and other things. But I, I have so much more appreciation for that phrase, go with your gut. Or what does your gut tell you? Because it tells you a lot. It's connected to your entire body. Um, and so it may be, for example, that your gut is telling you to lay off the dairy or the gluten or the alcohol or the caffeine or the sugar based on your individual system. That's why you know your body the best and how things affect it. Even if your brain is telling you to drink that mocha latte and, and then it's up to you whether or not to listen to your gut but you probably will be much healthier if you do, because yeah, it's like a canary in a coal mine. Your gut may be one of the best indicators of how the things you ingest affect you as an individual with your own unique biome. And, and, and this has to do with, you know, how it affects you physically with, with it, it could be something as simple like a, a stomach ache. Um, it could be men, like mental uh, on your mood, mood swings can be affected by what you eat and your, your individual gut. And one of the more interesting concepts related to human health is that this relationship goes along very well with what we've been taught. What, we, what we've thought was the case for a long time, we're told over and over again, and that is eating a very diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and fibers. And that's probably the best way to maintain a healthy gut, likely way more than, than what probiotics can do. Probiotics is the introduction of new bacteria into your system. Prebiotics, like a healthy diet, is the introduction of food that keeps your gut happy. And uh, Ellie Ward brought up this great image of, of the struggle of, of eating cabbage. So here's a case where your mind and your mouth might be telling you cabbage, no way. Or yeah, I like cabbage, but this mocha latte is in front of me. And, uh, you know, that's what I want to have right now. That's more important. Uh, so in my case, my brain often tells me, yes, you should stop at that Culver's for a butter burger. That's a fabulous idea. But if my gut were talking to me, you know, they'd be telling me, please <laughs> eat the cabbage. Don't stop at Culver's. And it's always the case that later my gut is telling me, yeah, I told you so, but you didn't listen. So um, there are other cases where your gut has stronger communication powers and even influences your behavior. It could be you just ate something really bad and your gut says, nope, uh, whatever you ate is wrong. I'm going to send it back out the front door. That's a, a pretty direct extreme example, um, but it could be more subtle, like, like feeling nervous about a potentially dangerous situation or feeling twitterpated with butterflies in your stomach. So your gut tells you a lot. And that phrase, listen to your gut, is probably way more meaningful than I've ever thought. 
Moving on, the Human Microbiome Project looked at 15 different human body habitats. Uh, and one of my favorites was the forearm, not just because it is one of the most diverse bacterial habitats, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, uh, but it also led to one of my favorite studies, uh, which I know Jenny was also familiar with, which is a study of roller derby teams. In roller derby, there is a lot of skin-to-skin -skin contact between participants. And with that, there is quite a bit of skin biome exchange. Uh, as I mentioned, your individual biome changes throughout your life. In this particular study, researchers swabbed the exposed arms of roller derby players on three teams from three different cities before and after a bout. <clears throat> and they found that before a bout, members of the same team shared similar patterns of microbiomes, in this case, bacteria, uh, much like you do with your, whoever you're in contact with, your family, your friends, even your pets, believe it or not, you, your, your microbiomes start to become more like each other. Uh, and you can actually even, you could, they could very accurately identify which team that roller derby player was on without knowing the individual. They could uh, match up their skin bacteria with the team very accurately. Um, so that explanation that players on the same team share similar microbiomes is likely because that team practices together often. And, but it also could be because certain bacteria tend to thrive in certain climates. So if you live in subtropical Miami, you will likely have a, a slightly different effect on your, uh, uh, the environment will have a slightly different effect on your skin and other microbiome than if you live in frigid Minneapolis. So um, after the bout, because there was so much skin to skin contact, the skin bacteria from all three teams started to more resemble each other and it became much harder to accurately identify the team of a given random player. Another fascinating aspect of a human biome has to do with how one acquires their own biome. There's some debate as to whether we are exposed before birth, but if we start with a particular uh, type of bacteria that help humans break down the sugars in milk, and in most people, these milk digesting bacteria reside in your gut, which makes sense. But when a woman becomes pregnant and, and moves towards the later stages of pregnancy, this particular community of milk digesting bacteria as well as a bunch of other types of microbes, they actually migrate down to the vaginal canal. And that's really important because as the baby leaves the mother in those last few moments, they are bathed in the microbiota of the mom's vaginal canal. And mom essentially gives baby this very important starter packet of, of her own microbiota, including that heavy dose of that milk digesting bacteria that the baby is gonna need right away as they switch to a diet of breast milk. Uh, a lot of mom's biota is directly and quickly absorbed through the skin uh, and, and some of it is swallowed, ingested. And understanding this exchange can also lead to much better options and outcomes of babies that are born with a C-section that don't experience that full extent of that biota. In, in fact, in some countries, I think where doctors are a little more open-minded than here, uh, after a C-section, the baby is kind of smeared in that biota to help with that. Um, and that starter packet is crucial uh, because one of the most important functions of your microbiota has to do with building and maintaining your immune system. Your microbiome is like a teacher. It's teaching and guiding your immune system. It, it, it's helping it to learn what's acceptable and not acceptable to have in your body. And it, it's it's a very obviously complex and holistic process. And after that initial dose for mom, uh, a person continues to build their microbiota throughout their lives. And uh, there's strong evidence, as Marilyn mentioned at the beginning, that those first few months and the first few years after birth are really important. Uh, evidence supports that babies that are kept in sterile environments tend to develop more uh, issues later in life uh, as a result of the imbalance and the, the immune system not learning properly compared to a baby that crawls around on the floor sticking random things in their mouth. Um, again, evidence shows that your microbiome is literally teaching your body and your immune system and helping it to grow strong. We used to play a game with my son Henry when he was an infant where we'd plop him down in a chair 
and then present him with different objects. And the name of the game was, will Henry put it in his mouth? And the answer was always yes. Um, if your immune system learns incorrectly, and this could happen for a variety of reasons, this can result in things like allergies, uh, which allergies are really a case of mistaken identity where your body misidentifies a friendly object as an intruder that must be attacked. And it can lead to errors in this process can lead to more serious um, issues with auto autoimmune diseases uh, like Crohn's and colitis and, and even autism. And because of this, uh, studies of your microbiome also hold the potential at treating these same diseases probably way better than some of the things that we're using now. Um, but again, your gut can also introduce some pretty nasty characters in your body. And so most of your T cells, when they're functioning properly, are, are patrolling that border of your gut. There's like, that's where the biggest security uh, is because, you know, your, your, your body's somewhat trusting what you put in your, in there, but you don't always know what's going in there. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of security along that, that gut border as well. Uh, I found this delightful short video, um, which actually was produced as part of the human microbiome project that, that kind of helps paint this introductory, introductory picture of human microbiota. So um, we'll take a quick moment and watch this. Give me a chance to sip my coffee. Alongside the cells that make up our bodies, there are trillions of microscopic organisms. It's not just the friendly bacteria in our guts that help us digest food. Bacteria live on our skin, in our mouths, and in the vagina. And it's not just bacteria. We're home to populations of viruses, fungi, and archaea too. When does this colonization begin? Most scientists think we acquire our first bacteria when we're born, and before that, babies develop in a sterile environment. But recently, a few studies have found traces of bacterial DNA in the placenta and in the amniotic fluid that surrounds the fetus, as well as in meconium, a baby's first poo. Could this be evidence of bacteria living with us before birth? Maybe but many scientists think these findings could be the result of contamination. There's an ongoing debate. Whatever the answer, everyone agrees that the first major colonization occurs during and just after birth. Babies born by vaginal delivery get a dose of bacteria from their mothers as they pass through the birth canal. After birth, the baby acquires more microbes from the air and from contact with objects and people around her. As she grows, many factors influence the makeup of her microbiota, her diet, whether or not she takes antibiotics or other drugs, how many people she interacts with, whether she has pets, where she lives, and potentially also her genetic makeup. Children that live in rural areas surrounded by animals and dirt host different sets of microbes to children brought up in urban environments. If children aren't exposed to a wide variety of microbes, they seem to be more likely to develop autoimmune and allergic conditions such as asthma and eczema. This is known as the hygiene hypothesis and it's one example of how our microbiota influences our health throughout our lives. By adulthood, our bodies contain as many microscopic organisms as human cells, if not more. Our physiology relies on these communities for example, they protect us from harmful bacteria and help us digest food. As microbes break down food, they produce molecules called metabolites, which circulate in the bloodstream, reaching all tissues of the body and affecting our metabolism. A diverse community of gut microbes contributes to a healthy metabolism. A less diverse microbiota is associated with inflammatory bowel disease, obesity and type 2 diabetes. Some studies even suggest that microbial metabolites can affect the brain and influence our mental health. As we get older, our microbiota continues to change. Studies show that the gut microbiota of older people differs from that of young adults, potentially contributing to ageing-related changes to our immune system and brain function. 
There's an awful lot still to learn about how the many microorganisms that live with us contribute to our well-being and influence our health. We need a better understanding of why microbes differ between people and how these differences affect our biology. And in particular, we need more studies of microbiomes in non-white populations and from all regions of the world. What is clear is that without these microbes, we wouldn't be here. So as we wrap up the human microbiota episode, um, I can confidently say that we will revisit this and a lot of these issues in future episodes, just as it's already been brought up several times in past episodes. Um, and I'll end by saying that I'm absolutely fascinated to think that right now my body is hosting a hundred trillion lives that are as dependent on me as I am on them. Um, I like to think of it that 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 there's a, a lot of little tiny David Attenboroughs inside me that are filming and narr narrating these scenes of viruses attacking bacteria in my nasal passages and never before seen footage of bacteria surrounding and capturing a protozoa. That was a terrible David Attenborough impression, but he's one of my heroes. Um, and while I will never discount the importance of social contact between humans, uh, I must say that all this activity and life in my body uh, makes it just a little bit harder for me to feel like I'm ever alone. Um, and then my, my, the, the final thought goes back to the mycorrhizae where for decades, researchers who were looking into these relationships were cast aside to the fringes and not taken seriously. Uh, and the same processes have been happening in the medical field really until very recently where people who were looking at how biota could be used to treat diseases um, we're not taken seriously. And so just like everything, uh, there's, there's nothing more important than keeping one's mind open to the wonders of how the natural world works. Thank you for joining me and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>